Special Attraction, The Tragic Case of Crystal St. Omer In a world divided by classicism and privilege, and where wealth and decadence intertwine, a sinister tale unfolds. On the morning of August 22, 2012, 17-year-old Crystal St. Omer left her Moshi residence to collect her CXC results at the Cassidy's Comprehensive Secondary School. When she failed to return home 24 hours later, relatives made an official report to the police. On August 25, 2012, the body of a young, intelligent, and vibrant young woman was discovered hidden in a place where her dreams would never come to fruition. In the affluent neighborhood of Kappa State Groselais, a sinister plot unfolded, involving a young man from a privileged background and a young and promising 17-year-old girl whose life was cut short in the name of love, jealousy, and obsession. As we explore the early life and the dynamics that shaped their psyche, we'll see how a seemingly perfect exterior concealed a dangerous obsession. Join us as we piece together the events that led to this tragic crime. Welcome to The Island's True Crime Podcast, where we unveil the skeletons hidden beneath the sand. A true crime podcast for the Caribbean by the Caribbean. If you're joining us for the first time, we hope to see you again. If you've been here before, welcome back. Today, we unravel the heartbreaking tale of a wealthy teenager whose love turned deadly. This was a fatal attraction. What went wrong? The morning of August 22, 2012 started as an ordinary morning in St. Omer household. Crystal was tasked to run errands in the city of Castries and would also be making a stop at her former secondary school to pick up her CXC results. These results would determine her eligibility to enter the local community college. The Caribbean Examination Council's Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate, or SCEC, exams are the equivalent of a high school or secondary school diploma. We can assume that, like most students who've sat an exam, Crystal would have been anxious and nervous to collect her results. It's confirmed that she was able to receive her results and that she did exceptionally well. She left the school with joy and proceeded to Castries. She was seen leaving the St. Lucia Civil Service Cooperative Credit Union on the corner of Jeremy Street and Chasse Road, but vanished without a trace after that. A missing persons report was subsequently filed by the Royal St. Lucia Police Force on August 23, 2012, about 24 hours after her family realized that she never returned home. It was unusual for Crystal to stay out till dark and not inform her family. Because Crystal only have so much friends, but, but not too many friends. And the friend Crystal knew, people know the friend, and people will, he'll get caught. She never stayed out to say 7, 8 o'clock, nobody see Crystal in the yard. Crystal always home. From school, she leave, she get home the latest for quarter to, to 4, to 4 o'clock. Who was Crystal St. Omer? Born on April 13, 1995, Crystal was a young, vibrant woman who attended the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School. She was a part of many clubs and took part in numerous school activities. She was a staple in her family, being described as loving, caring, very trustworthy, and quite responsible. At a young age, she was tasked with taking care of her grandmother, which she proudly did without complaining, showing her dedication to her family. Family members described Crystal St. Omar as a very quiet, loving individual who had few friends. Her father last saw her on the morning of her disappearance. There must be justice. Time and time there must be justice. Because Crystal is an innocent child. Her teachers and classmates described her as a well-behaved and highly disciplined young woman who was very focused on her studies and would never speak out of turn. Her future seemed bright, and everyone had high hopes for her. Mario Perez Charles, on the other hand, lived a life of luxury, shielded from the harsh realities many would face. But behind the opulence, a dark obsession was growing. 
Mario was born into a family who had concreted their legacy and wealth in St. Lucian society. His father, William Charles, or Charles as he's referred to, is the owner of American Drywall, a prominent lumber and hardware company in the 90s to early 2000s. He grew up in a mansion overlooking the Caribbean Sea decked with a personal boat dock and a multi-story house in the upper-class neighborhood of Vigi Castries. He attended the Sir Iris Simmons Secondary School, where he was an average student. On his 18th birthday, he was gifted a classic Jaguar by his father, which he destroyed in less than a week. Upon graduation, Mario was employed at his dad's company. His father also left their house at Vigi in his care and moved to Florida after a major business venture in Rodney Bay Groselet failed. Although this had a big impact on his family's finances, they were still far from being broke. In fact, Mario was the definition of being born with a golden spoon. What led these two people, seemingly from different backgrounds, into each other's paths, and what happened on that fateful day? Though there isn't enough public data to back this theory, our sources have indicated that the detectives on the case used lots of digital forensics to convict Mario. The common theory was that the two were familiar with each other and that Crystal agreed to meet Mario on the tragic day. Mario Charles was known to Crystal, something confirmed by family members. He attended the Sir Ira Simmons Secondary School, a stone's throw away from the Cassius Comprehensive. Mario's mother reportedly stumbling on information that implicated her son in the crime made the difficult decision to turn him in to the authorities. Speculation is rife on what turned this meetup into a heartbreaking event. As we stated, Crystal was reported missing on July 22, 2012. But three days later, the entire nation would be shocked. On August 25, 2012, all hope that Crystal would return home safely died and everything changed. The events of that fateful day shook the community to its core and shocked the nation. The morning was bright in the affluent neighborhood of Cap Estate, Groselet. While on a routine morning walk, a resident couldn't help but notice a vile stench in the air. The foul stench, which was quite distinct and reminiscent of decomposing flesh, was quite vivid, leading the neighbor to think it was nearby. Not wanting to ignore the stench, the curious neighbor moved closer to the horrifying stench where they made a horrifying discovery. The body of 17-year-old Crystal St. Omer was discovered in a partial state of decomposure. The decomposed body was reportedly discovered three days later on August 25th in a remote area in the north of the island. The assistant commissioner of police with responsibility for major crime at the time, Francis Henry, said, When the body was found, there were signs that would suggest that there were marks that were before death and possibly after death. That body was found beneath a retaining wall which had a height of about 12 feet. So it appears that the body was thrown over the walls and the body was partially clothed. This discovery was felt by the entire nation prompting government ministers and people of influence to address the matter. Candlelight vigils and public outcry for justice could not be contained. They came by bus, by car, and on foot, representing a wider cross-section of the society, and converged on the front lawn of the family that's still in mourning at the death of Crystal St. Omer. The entire nation of St. Lucia wanted answers, and they would accept nothing less. An autopsy was carried out, which determined that Crystal was strangled, and that there weren't visible signs of the R-word or SA. What was visible was that, in her last moments, Crystal showed formidable strength in trying her best to fight off her attacker or attackers. We say attackers because, though only one person was charged in this crime, it's still unclear if he is the only perpetrator. Through rigor mortis, examiners determined that she passed away on the same day she was reported missing. Many questions were left to be answered. Who would want to hurt this innocent young woman? Why would someone discard her body so inappropriately? Why her? These questions would soon have answers when three men were questioned on the matter. The first young man, who hailed from Redouille Groselet, allegedly gave himself to Christ in the later days. 
The second young man, whose last name is Scott, was also from a prominent background and resided in Rodney Bay, Groselay. But the final one, who piqued the detective's interest and was eventually convicted, was Mario Perez Charles. A pensive-looking, sullen and dejected Mario Perez Charles entered the courtroom, sleeves buttoned down to the wrist, his head bent most of the time. Scores of people turned up eagerly, wanting to see the man charged with this heinous crime. How can someone from such a prominent family be accused of such a vile crime? As we previously stated, Mario grew up in a wealthy household, but that didn't stop him from yearning to be part of what we call street life in St. Lucia. Although Mario's nefarious behaviors were unknown to the public, he was well known by the police. He kept the company of known thugs and by the age of 19 had been arrested for grand theft auto and the possession of an illegal firearm. These offenses never saw the light of day, as Mario's family allegedly hired high-powered lawyers to get the charges dealt with quietly. Nonetheless, Mario was subsequently arrested on August 30th, 2012, five days after Crystal's body was found. This leads us to the legal battle between the state and Mario Perez Charles. One would think that this case would be cut and dry, but that would be so far from the truth. The case ran for 10 years. Yes, you heard me right, 10 years. The case began in September 2012, though he had made his first court appearance on August 30th, 2012 to be charged. When Mario made his first court appearance, he was met with a huge public presence. The air was thick with anticipation, and as the minutes passed, so too did the crowd grow. Scores gathered outside the courthouse, but kept at bay by police tape and alert officers. He was first represented by Hudgens Nicholas, but a month later at his sufficiency hearing, he was represented by high-powered lawyer Mr. Alberton Richel Yu. During this time, the funeral of Crystal St. Omer was held 10 days after her body was found. The atmosphere was one of sadness, as her family, friends, former classmates, parents, and other concerned citizens showed up. It was a solemn moment for family members and mourners who came to bid farewell to Crystal St. Omer. The day marked a unification of St. Lucians for the goal of laying this angel to rest. Towards the end of 2012, there weren't any major shifts in the case. On January 26, 2013, another sufficiency hearing was postponed to March. But Crystal's family was not permitted to be part of the in-court proceedings, and by their accounts, they weren't pleased with the way the court officers dealt with them. Um, a closed court hearing, and then we were just sitting there and waiting. And we didn't know anything until somebody just whispered that the case is going on, why aren't you all inside? So I'm not understanding because these failed attempts are really unnecessary because we are part of the process. Moving forward to 2019, seven years after the case began, Crystal's alleged killer was yet to be convicted, much less sentenced, which left a feeling of uncertainty. The case had also lost public interest due to the long, drawn-out process of justice in St. Lucia. But every year, her family made sure to keep in contact with the media to remind the public that they had yet to attain justice. My sister was this very jovial, bubbly, loving individual, was so full of life. She was 17 when she was brutally murdered, and everyone remembers her as being that family person. She loved her family, she loved kids, and she was a happy soul. I think eight years is a long time to be awaiting justice. I think a lot more could have been done to speed up the case. In 2022, the silver lining finally appeared, and justice would seemingly be served. After a 10-year-long, drawn-out court process, Mario Perez Charles finally pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 18 years and six months in prison, 10 years of which will be deducted from his sentence for time served. Though the family was disappointed in the sentencing, the prosecution highlighted that since his incarceration, Mario was a model inmate. In his statement to the court, Mario listed a myriad of reasons for his behavior including coming from a broken home. As we conclude this harrowing tale, we reflect on the lessons to be gleaned from this tragic true crime story. 
Crystal's memory became a symbol of resilience and a catalyst for change. Her legacy, a cautionary tale etched in the annals of true crime, urged society to confront the uncomfortable truths about the dynamics of violence against women and the consequences that can unfold. How can both society and the justice system collaboratively evolve to better safeguard our young women? All we know is that nothing can bring back this life lost, which was cut short just as it was blossoming due to this unforgivable act. Let's find a way forward where justice is not just a word, but a tangible reality for every woman whose narrative has been marred by crime in the Caribbean. This Christmas season, when families come together and friends create memories, we plead that you remember Crystal. Please stop the violence. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the chilling story of Crystal St. Omer and Mario Perez. True crime reminds us that darkness can lurk even in the most unexpected places. If you found this video intriguing, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more riveting true crime content. Until next time, stay vigilant.